Okay, this video is going to discuss relative motion. Um, relative motion refers to an assumption that we've been making about motion to this point, and that is uh, that we are assuming whatever we're comparing ourselves to, whether it's the earth or the classroom that we're in or wherever the motion is taking place, we're assuming that that thing itself is not moving. If you think of yourself right now sitting in your desk watching this video, you might think to yourself that you're stationary. And in a sense, you are stationary. You're stationary if you consider your motion relative to your desk or the building, or essentially the buildings uh, in a foundation in the earth. So really, you're really comparing your motion relative to the earth. But if we think about it for a little bit of a second here, we'll remember that you might be sitting at a little table. Here you are. But that that table, that the earth is spinning fairly quickly, like all the way around once every 24 hours, right? And even more than that, the um, earth itself is orbiting the sun. And all these other motions are going on that we, we sort of ignore. We can ignore them because they don't have a lot of acceleration with them, so we're not feeling any sort of forces that are causing us to go along with them pushing us this way or pushing us that way. So they're sort of ignorable, but at the same time, when you're sitting in your desk right now, you're not sitting still. You're only sitting still relative to the earth. The earth itself is moving, and so you're spinning and you're, and you're um, revolving around the sun. It comes back to what we said about position in the first place. Remember that position is always relative to some fixed reference point, and so if that reference point is moving, then we might feel like we're staying still, but really it's just that us and the reference point are both moving at the same speed. From time to time, it's important to consider not just your speed relative to your natural frame of reference, but your speed relative to another frame of reference. If we want to change the frame of reference, then the way we do that is it's almost like the origin itself is moving relative to the new reference point that we want. So let's say for example that we have our we have uh, a reference point A and that's us and we are maybe here we are and we're moving relative to that reference point at two meters per second this way well east why not and then we want to change so that our reference point, our new reference point is B. If A and B aren't moving relative to each other, then this doesn't matter. This is important. But what if A is moving at 2 meters per second east as well? So you can imagine at time 1, here you are. And then at time 2, the whole cart that you consider yourself to be on as well as you what relative on the cart step forward and not only have you moved but your reference point has moved as well so we might say that you stepped a distance forward of two meters in that one second and the cart stepped a distance forward of two meters in that one second but the result then is that you've moved ahead a total of four meters your velocity relative to B is your velocity plus the velocity of the reference point that you're talking about. We can say this in a vector equation. The velocity of the object relative to res reference frame B is equal to the velocity of the object relative to the old one A plus how fast A is moving with B. As another example here, imagine you're on a train. just so that we have a little bit to work with, I'll make three railway cars. And you're going to walk from the back of the train to the front of the train with a speed of, say, 3 meters per second. The train itself is kicking along at 20 meters per second. 
If I was standing here, what would I see? Alternatively, if I was standing on the train, what would I see? So the person standing on the train would see the velocity of the object relative to the train to be 3 meters per second. That's from this point of view. From this point of view, I would see the velocity of the ob of the velocity of the train as it zooms by to be 20 meters per second. And if I looked at the object relative to me, so that's I'm going to call this uh, stationary. Actually, I'll call it Earth because we'll assume I'm standing on the Earth. The train relative to the Earth and the uh, object relative to the Earth, then I, I can imagine that he's moving along at 20 plus the 3 that he's moving towards the front for 23 meters per second. And I think we can see through this illustration that the velocity of the object relative to the Earth is equal to the velocity of the object relative to the train plus the velocity of the train relative to the Earth. And for a simple fact here, we can see that these two, these two letters are the same. If I were to do this in a vector scale diagram, I would say, if I call this point O, and I call this point T, and then I go to point E, then O to T and T to E is equal to O to E, all the way across, right? To show that this is a vector diagram, we should consider the same scenario, but this time the guy that's moving will be moving from the front of the train all the way to the back of the train. So now he's going the opposite direction. What that means then, if we want to consider this, is that it's negative 3 meters per second. Again, looking at what the person on the land would see, the velocity of the train relative to the earth still sits at 20 meters per second. The train is still chugging by. But that guy walking towards the back appears to actually be going a little bit slower than the train. He's not moving as far forward as the train is. If he looked, you'd see 17 meters per second. And that's because the velocity of the object relative to the Earth would be the velocity of the object relative to the train plus velocity of the train relative to the Earth, which is 20 plus a negative 3 meters per second. And since this is a vector equation, we keep those signs in, and that's how we end up with 17 meters per second. This will work as a vector equation for two dimensions, and we will be using our two-dimensional component method to add vectors in both of these directions, but conceptually that's not that important right now. So finally, I'd like to deal with a couple scenarios that are the common, common types of problems that you'll see with uh, with relative motion. Imagine, for example, a ship in the water. If the ship's in the water, and you're way out at sea, let's say, and you have some sort of instrument on your ship to measure speed. Let's say, for example, you're throwing out a string, and you're measuring how many knots uh, of the string go under the water in a certain period of time, and that's where the term knots comes from, but let's just say that's how you're measuring your speed for your boat. Then you're going to measure, naturally, the velocity of your boat relative to the water. Keeping that in mind, what if all of this water is moving from side to side as this is happening? So there's a velocity of the water relative to the earth. Since we don't sail ships from one spot in the water to another spot in the water, but we're interested in going to different points of land, the velocity of the boat relative to the water isn't really what we want. What we really want is we want to get the boat somewhere some, with reference to the earth. So we have to take these two velocities and consider them, or, and add them. So that's one conceptual what place where this happens. Imagine again that you're swimming in a current, you could be swimming with the current or against the current, and that's going to affect overall relative to the ground how far you're getting or how fast you're going. The other thing is um, 
or well another example of this that illustrates this concept is when you're at the beach. If you've ever been at the beach, often, especially if it's an ocean, there's a significant current in the ocean. So you're out in the waves and you find yourself jumping up and down and enjoying the waves coming by and just enjoying that experience of going up and down. And then you look up at the beach and you notice that you've moved either left or right of your stuff that you left on the side over time. And the reason is because when you're in the water, you start paying attention to your motion relative to the water and you ignore the current, you ignore the velocity of the water relative to the earth. And so that's what pushes you from side to side. Another, um, another, and this used to be the most important application of this, but another application of this, which is not as important since we came up with GPS, is navigation for airplanes. Again, when an airplane, I can't draw an airplane, gets up into the sky high enough, it starts to really only pay attention to its velocity relative to the air. So if the air is going by, then the plane can fly faster or slower relative to the air. In the meantime, the wind itself, or the air itself, might be moving relative to the earth. We call that wind. And so again, because a plane isn't interested in navigating from one place in the air to the other place in the air, but it, and presumably it's going to land at some point, the velocity of the plane relative to the earth is equal to the velocity of the plane relative to the air plus the velocity of the air relative to the earth. And so it used to be important for pilots to consider how far or what their speed is relative to the wind and then take the wind into account to make sure that they're navigating in the right direction. Now we kind of know that this is all simplified by GPS and this isn't as important as it used to be, but um, but obviously it's still an illustration of the point. So that's what I'm going to talk about conceptually for frames of reference. I'm going to come back uh, and do some just mathematics with this where we can see how we can use our component method to add relative velocities in different directions and how we can actually use diagrams to solve these problems as well.